I want to introduce to you Ken Braddy. Some of you know Ken, and uh, we'll we'll be visiting for a little while, and 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 we've got some questions that you guys have submitted, and a lot of good questions, um, a lot of hard questions, uh, but good ones. And so we're going to deal with those for a few minutes, and then we're going to do, if we can, uh, a little open mic as much as we can. But let me just tell you a little about Ken, in case you don't know him. He's our director of Sunday School uh, for Southern Baptist at Lifeway, and uh, also the manager of all of our adult ongoing Bible series, Bible studies. Um, and uh, Ken, how long have you been at Lifeway? It's been a while now. It has. I, I crossed the 11 year mark in wow. March. So just a little over 11 years now. 11 years at Lifeway. Uh, that's great. Um, Ken's written several books and training guides uh, among those. I think the latest, and if you want to tell us about it later, that's fine, Ken, but Building a Disciple Making Ministry, uh, The Timeless Principles of Arthur Flake for Sunday School and Small Groups. And um, some of you are nodding because you, you know who Arthur Flake is. If you don't, you need to get to know him. Uh, and then also one that's been really helpful to me recently, Breathing Life into Sunday School, uh, that it came out, uh, gosh, it's been two years, year or two ago. Yeah, 2019. Uh, which is really helpful, just some great principles and, and help for uh, and encouragement for Sunday School leaders. And then, like I say, lots of other uh, training guides and materials that, um, that, that are available to you uh, through Lifeway and through, through Ken. Um, Ken's got Texas roots, and one of these days we're going to get him back home. I don't know there when that'll be, um, but one thing that's helping us is he's got grandkids here. So, um, if he, I think he probably wanted to share his screen because he wants to show pictures of those uh, those grandkids. I'm not sure, but uh, the thing that I love about Ken is even though he's at Lifeway and and uh, oversees a pretty amazing um, breadth of operation there he hasn't lost touch with the local church and the leaders that you and I work with in our churches uh, Ken served as minister of education I think groups pastor uh, in Texas but also has continued to do that uh, in churches in the Nashville area since he's been at Lifeway and so Ken that that means a lot to me um, that you're not just speaking from someone who's um, kind of oversees a large organization but you're speaking as one who has a heart for the church and who's busy and among church members every week. So uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, Ken blogs at KenBratty.com. So be sure and go there and, and bookmark that. But Ken, thank you for being with us today. It's good to have you. David, you are most welcome. I do appreciate the invitation. And it is always good uh, to be with fellow Texas Baptists. And you're right. We will get back to Texas one of these <laughs> days. I've got a pretty strong pull, two grandkids and uh, a son and a daughter-in-law there. And uh, yeah, we love Texas. Uh, there is no better feeling, David, than you know if we're driving back when we cross that border there in Arkansas into Texas, because I know we're just minutes away from a Whataburger stop. <laughs> now, I have to say, you have to be careful there because I grew up and found a wife in Texarkana, Arkansas. So Maybe when you get to the outskirts of Texarkana. Okay, how about that? Yeah. It's on the state line road. That's right. That's, that's, that's right. where we stop. That's exactly right. <laughs> there is one on the state line, I think. Yeah, good deal. Well, as I mentioned, you guys asked a bunch of good questions uh, when you registered. And so Ken and I will kind of play off of those questions, and some of them will, will get answered. I have to say that some of them may get answered in a later uh, version of a roundtable, but because there were so many. Uh, we'll get to what we can. So uh, the topic for today is helping group leaders embrace healthy change. And I told Ken, I'll tell the rest of you, when that question first came to me, I thought, well, that's a great question. And then I thought, well, maybe not, because it was phrased, <laughs> helping group leaders embrace change. Um, so I took the liberty of going and adding the word healthy. And I want us to start there, Ken, um, with this idea of change maybe change versus healthy change. What makes change healthy? Well, I, I'm going to answer it uh, in a negative way first, and then we'll spin it back around. But I, I think change just for the sake of change is probably not healthy. And I do think that there are, there are folks that they're just wired you know, to do something different every so often. And I think in the world of church, that's probably not 
as helpful, right? Because at least my experience has been that our folks tend to be a little hesitant, you know, to embrace too much change too quickly. We were, uh, when I was serving on staff at a church in Grapevine, uh, we were in the process of changing our Sunday morning schedule and had talked that through. We thought talked it to death and, and we were accused of always changing things. And, you know, we couldn't even figure out when the last time we had changed something like that. <laughs> and we realized that people have a very low threshold, you know, when it comes to the change. So I've, I've discovered that, you know, change for change sake is, is definitely not a healthy thing. I do think that uh, change uh, that is healthy uh, probably has a, a few uh, characteristics. One is that, you know, healthy change typically is done for the benefit of the change recipients, right? Mm-hmm. So we, you know, we change something because we want our people you know, to have a better experience, a better life. Uh, we want them to have a better, uh, you know, experience at church uh, in reaching our communities and those kinds of things. And so if we can, you know, make changes that benefit people, I think that's a part of, you know, healthy change. I also think that a change that is healthy is also sustainable. It doesn't implode and collapse after the change. I think it is something that, uh, you know, we can see that it does benefit others, benefits the organization and for the long haul. So I think, you know, that's another part, another side of, of healthy change. And then I think when people feel valued in the change, I think that makes for healthy change, David. I think that folks need to feel like they, that their thoughts, their, uh, pushbacks, their questions have been heard by those that are in leadership making those changes. I think most folks are okay with change, but I think they get resistant when they decide that they're not being listened to, something is being unilaterally handed down to them, and they don't have a voice or a say in it. And I have found that folks are, are pretty agreeable when they feel like they've been heard and they're, you know, they've been listened to and they've been responded to well. So I think that's a part of healthy change is uh, is how the other people on the other side of it that are not involved in the decision, as long as they feel like they have had you know a voice listened to, I think that's that's uh, a helpful thing. And then finally, I think I'll say that um, you know change that is healthy is change that leaves people pretty hopeful and very positive about the future. They understand the reason for it. They see that better tomorrow. Uh, they know what goal the you know organization is trying to get to. And it just leaves them with a brighter future and so, or a hope for a brighter future. So I think those are some, some key elements I would say are top of mind, you know, would be part of healthy change. Yeah. Well, what you said about um, changes for their benefit, for the benefit of the people who are actually a part of the change is is part of the definition to me of of, uh, um, servant leadership and uh, what sets servant leadership apart from other kinds of leadership and you're doing it not because you think it's a great idea, but because it, it really helps the group or the organization and in, in our case, the church get to where we all want to go. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, one of the things that comes out of this question too, or a question that comes from the, the topic is what kind of change are we after? Somebody asked that, what, what does this change look like? And I think, with everything you've just said, sort of as a baseline for it's positive, it moves the church forward, uh, people have been heard, it takes time, it takes consistency uh, in leadership. What are we after? Um, and I know that could that could vary. You know, one, one group or one organization, one ministry could want one thing, but uh, just in general terms, what are we, what are we looking for when we talk about change? Well, we're probably talking about a few things, uh, David, we're probably talking about, uh, you know, doing things better, more efficiently, you know, those kind of things. But, but when you think about, you know, the mission of the church, you know, we're probably talking about, uh, you know, the things that we do have to, you know, always ultimately come down to uh, our, our great commission, you know, we're, we're called to make disciples and, you know, we, we make changes so that we can be more effective, you know, at doing that. That's, I mean, that's the core mission. And, uh, you know, now that I serve at Lifeway, you know, our, our goal is to support you, to support churches in, in the church's mission, you know, in, in your mission of making disciples, because we know when Jesus comes back, Lifeway does not exist, you know, but people, the church do, they go on and into eternity. 
and we cease to exist. And so I, I think that uh, what are we after? Well, we're after you know disciples. We're after you know making disciples who will ultimately you know repeat that process and help make more disciples. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, um, certainly does. I mean, there's another. There's a bigger question that comes to that as well. Those of us who are in traditional Sunday school churches or historical kind of traditional churches, uh, how do we how do we initiate change? And I think that's a it's part of one of the other questions. But how do you how do you uh, make disciples when that's not necessarily been your your sweet spot or i mean we've always said that we've always said great commission great commandment um but if we've not been effective i think now is a key time to look at okay how can we how can we finally get to disciple making instead of just teaching content that kind of thing um and and for many of our people that's a big change in the way they think yeah, it's a big paradigm shift. I do think that there is a huge opportunity. I've been telling pastors since late last year, you know, we've got the front half of this year. Now we're already, I mean, I can't believe we're fixed to walk into June next week, right? Yeah. And and the year's half over. And uh, and most churches that I'm hearing from, and, and y'all could probably affirm or deny this, but we're hearing uh, for the most part that uh, churches, you know, they've reopened. Uh, most have reopened their groups. They're still you know, seeing, uh, you know, people starting to return, but everybody looks like is thinking about September being kind of the big, you know, return. It's back to school vaccinations. You know, we've been through summer, you know, it just feels like it's getting in the rearview mirror. And this is definitely the moment to be having conversations with our church families about what, what beyond COVID looks like. And this is a great moment to hit whatever cosmic, you know, reset button that there may be, you know, in the area of group ministry, and to say, look, you know, pre-COVID, we thought it was X, but going forward, you know, we would love to see, you know, this change in our groups. And I think, uh, David, the reorientation to our groups being about making disciples, you know, teaching is a function of that, fellowshipping is a function of that, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we need to reorient our group leaders uh, to the fact that that's really the main mission. That's why we do groups in the first place, you know. And so it is, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity, I think, right now and into, I think, even into 2022, I think the church and its leaders, you know, will still be very open to, uh, we're going to be in a very, uh, you know, uh, period of time where I think, uh, you know, people's thoughts on, on what church is, what groups are, is going to be very moldable and bendable and pliable. Yeah. And I think it's a great, it's a great coming 12 months for us as a church. Yeah, yeah. But one of the challenges that I, have picked up just talking with folks around Texas is churches. We talked about how diverse our churches are early on um, when we first got started, but they're really diverse when it comes to how they're stepping back into ministry, worship, Sunday school, small groups, all those things. There's so many, so many different approaches and it's not just a rural versus city kind of thing. It really is a, um, an individual church mindset. And so I'm, I'm here and I talked with two pastors on Monday who aren't doing anything uh, yet. It's online. They're doing some things online, uh, but they, they're not back for worship yet. Uh, on the other hand, I know of one or two who, who never quit and another one who said, if I'd known that's, that, that's all it was going to be, I never would have closed down to begin with either. So that whole range has, has uh, put a new dynamic, um, and right in the middle of what we try to do as leaders. Um, so I guess with that in mind, this other question about how do you prioritize changes? Um, and this specific question was in a historic church, but I think for all of our churches, um, you know, how do you set priority at a time like this? Because a lot of people are saying, let's get back to normal. Um, you know, one of the questions was, how do we get people to come back? Um, now that things are reopening. Um, so when it comes to prioritizing what we should change, what do you see there? I would say, uh, David, that uh, things that, that help us to focus on evangelism, we can, we can definitely head in uh, that direction in our churches. Things that help us move people out of rows and into groups, I think is another very healthy thing to focus on right now. Uh, in historic churches or, or non-traditional churches, 
Uh, we know uh, we know that the research bears out, you know, that people that are in groups uh, give more, they pray more, serve more, they confess sin more. You know, it's just a, it's a wonderful thing uh, if you can get folks into groups. And so I think right now, you know, part of the part of the goal uh, is to I would prioritize group ministry and our corporate worship and. I would I would steer people there in particular, you know, because those two are such an important part of of church life, and uh, and we know again from the research that sixty eight percent of folks that walk through our church doors are, are very open to attending our Bible study groups. I mean, we know that from a research project we did earlier this year, uh, and about six percent are actively looking to connect with a group. So now we're in about the seventy five percent range. So that's three out of four people are very open. So. I think that is one one place I'd start swinging the axe, you know, is is there in group involvement. So uh, that'd be one thing that I would I would say prioritize that. Um, I would say also, David, you know, right now it's a it's a great time to prioritize where our our budget dollars are going there. COVID has given us a very unique opportunity. And I've had I've had people say in meetings, you know, don't waste a good pandemic. Right. And so, you know, with that in mind, you budget scrub scrub of the budget and there may be some things some programs uh some some things that is drawing church resources away from its most important ministries which i'm i'm going to say is worship and bible study that would be the two primary there may be some things that during this pandemic that now as we're emerging from it uh, we might want to say you know as we reprioritize things we're going to reprioritize you know, what we know to statistically be, you know, the, the, the greatest places for people to involve themselves in church, and that's worship and Sunday school. So we're going to kind of maybe redirect some dollars and rechannel monies into those most important resources. And that may mean that some things that we've been doing for a while uh, that, you know, have been, you know, traditionally, you know, favorite uh, things that the, the church may have done, but not necessarily effective, it may be time for those to retire and to give way to, you know, refocusing on, on the core of our ministries. Does that make yes. sense? It makes a lot of sense, but you just opened another can of worms uh, <laughs> for all of us. So let me if, before I, before I tell you what that can of worms is, if everybody doesn't already know, uh, if, if, take notes if you're if you're listening and, and you have something pops into your head. We're going to do a little open mic a little bit later, so just know that's coming in uh, five or six minutes probably. But the can of worms can is we've got a lot of folks who are so attached to these old ministries. How do we leap beyond that and how do we help them get on board? Um, one of the things, and I'm kind of got a stopwatch on how, how long we, the two of us can go without mentioning a book title, but yeah. I'm about to mention one. I, I was and just speaking to uh, as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Leading Change by John Carter, which is a, it's a secular book and it's been around for a long time. I know you've mentioned one called uh, that Carter wrote, which was a follow-up, I think, called Our, Our Iceberg is Melting. That's right. Um, and one of the things that he really talks about is, is having, um, I think he refers to it as a guiding coalition and having people on board with whatever the change is before you just jump out there and do it. And right. so I think timing is an issue that we have to be really careful with, along with having people on board who can help us go and talk to those folks who, you know, they, they've been doing ministry X for 45 years in our church. And how in the world could you suggest that we don't need to spend ministry dollars on that anymore? So any response right. or, or thoughts on that kind of a, an issue? Yeah, I, I would I would not want to perpetuate a ministry just so that somebody's happy, you know, and has something to do uh, that they feel great about. If it's not contributing to you know, making disciples, if it is not uh, contributing to uh, reaching people for Christ, uh, if it's something that we're doing just to do, that's probably one of those things that uh, needs to get 86, you know, and it's painful because folks, you know, they get in, they fall in love with their, you know, their particular ministry. It kind of becomes maybe a source of identity for them. But I think you have to, you have to look at the overall, you know, contribution it might be making or not making to the goal of, you know, making disciples and uh, involving folks uh, in, in, you know, deeper part of our, our church life. Yeah. And you mentioned Cotter's book, you know, both that book and the uh, icebergs melting, uh, and uh, and even uh, something that I'm, I think I want to I want to share here on the uh, the screen in a second. Sure. Yeah. Uh, that sense of urgency, you know, that he, they talk about it. It, it really it's in, it's in every leadership and, and book on change and transition that you want to pick up. 
And that is, uh, and that really goes to motivation, right? Motivating people. And the starting point is creating a sense of urgency, you know, and some of that, uh, David, is sometimes that, you know, what we're doing is not being effective. We're losing a generation We're we're missing reaching people in other ways because we're funding and fueling uh, this other ministry. And, and sometimes, you know, it's not just the finances, but it's the, it's the personnel time, the volunteer time. It's the time on the church calendar that it takes up, you know, that other things could be meeting and, and they could be doing things. So there's a, there's a, you know, a cost of opportunity there, you know, that yeah. sometimes we don't really think about, you know, as a church. Yeah. Go ahead go ahead and tee up what you want to share, but I'll just, you know, kind of on that same idea of motivating. That was another one of our questions. How do you motivate and equip for multiplication? And I don't know if that was specifically for groups or Sunday school. I kind of guess it might be since multiplication was the word there, but yeah. you know, related to, to motivating people and um, developing a sense of urgency, um, all big deals. But um, yeah, share that. Share that uh, framework with us there if you'd like. Yeah, so this is a, a framework that we really like uh, using at Lifeway. It's something that uh, Eric Geiger, when he was our, our vice president, uh, that he was able to instill in our company. Uh, and so we began using this as a communication tool. And, uh, and it starts uh, with the common denominator, which you can see on the top left corner of that uh, that figure yeah. and uh, and that's where you start you know you you start by building some emotional connection you know with your your past or your shared history and so the thing you move to very next and this was the this is the you know the issue of creating uh, you know that that movement is you you've got to have a burning platform and and you want to address you know hey look this is the the thing that is happening right now uh, in our church or in our city or in our culture that we have to go and do something about, because if we don't, it's just not going to be a good thing. And you move quickly there uh, into the golden tomorrow. You start talking about uh, the hope and the change that you can bring about, you know, for the future. And then you move to that wake up call in that bottom uh, right uh, corner there. And you go back to that sense of urgency. How do you, how do you, how do you create this idea that, We've got to move forward, but you know, there's a plan to get us forward. So that's when you go over to mind stretch. And now it is, uh, it is talking about a God-sized project, a God-sized vision for whatever change you're wanting to implement. If it's the elimination of a ministry, starting another one, retooling an existing one. But this is where you, you have to help folks understand that, that you're dreaming in such a big way about this, that, uh, that this is a God-sized dream and a, a God-sized, audacious type of a goal, and you move right from there, you segue in that same conversation into the God smile, which is we would do this because there's a biblical base, and there is something in this that is going to please our Father, and so we have used, you know, this framework uh, as a way uh, for us to implement change in the company, and, uh, and I, we've used it in, you know, lots of training events, but it's become a nice framework that really helps to, I think it doesn't necessarily exactly follow Cotter's eight steps, but you can see many of his steps, you know, in, in this, uh, this process. But again, yeah. it's all about that urgency and creating that vision for the better future. And then talking about how this aligns with scripture and God's desires for people. And then I think that's, it's, it's helpful to help churches, uh, you know, move through change by using that kind of a framework. Yeah. And is it, can we share that with, Folks, is that okay? Yeah, to, I'll be, yeah, I will. I'll uh, make sure that I send this to you, and you, you yeah. feel free. I've to got share it, it and and I'll. Oh, great. Yeah, I've got yeah. it, and I'll send that out to everybody that registered um, after we're done today. Um, <clears throat> but that's that's really just the talking points. I mean, that's not implementation. But that's just how you kind of talk through yeah. and get people on board. Uh, so implementation still comes uh, beyond that, um, and I think that's. That's where a lot of us who are on this call are. Uh, we're the ones that are charged with the implementation, not just the vision casting and so forth. But to have that framework is very helpful. Um, one other question, and I think we'll open it up just a little bit. But um, this one, and I don't want to spend too much time here, probably Ken, because a lot of us, if we've talked, we've talked with lots of folks about this. But I would be interested to know what changes you expect. What are you seeing? on a national level, as far as Sunday school groups, worship, what are the changes that seem to be the most uh, obvious or um, causing the, the, the greatest 
adjustment for churches? Yeah, I, I think that, well, there are a couple of things, uh, Dave. I think that uh, one thing that we're going to see uh, came out in an article by Kerry Neoff. Uh, he always does this, you know, the article at the first of the year on trends, and right. he calls it, and this year's was eight disruptive trends, you know, that will, you know, rock the church or whatever his verbiage was. Yeah, he had, he had to change his trends last year because the pandemic hit two months after he wrote his articles. But yes, anyway, yeah, go ahead, that? 2021. Yeah, yeah. Had to be pretty flexible, didn't he? Yeah. But uh, I think I think his number five on his list of eight for 2021, I think he is absolutely dead on, you know, nail on the head with the hammer kind of a thing. And uh, he said that a trend that we are going to see and a change that we're going to see, especially in our group ministries, is a, a movement away from content being king and more toward community being that. And I think he's right. Uh, people during the pandemic, I mean, they could have done it before the pandemic, but during the pandemic, they sure did it because their churches moved online. And we all discovered, hey, we can worship and we can be online and hear from our pastors. And then we quickly moved next door and said, you know, uh, when I'm through with this, you know, with my church service, I can go see X pastor out there that I've always heard about. And I can watch and listen and participate in the worship of that church and hear his teaching. And, and it made people you know, pretty flexible. And, uh, and they can get their content from a number of places, David. And, and sometimes the content that's out there is greater than what our churches can, can provide, right? And so uh, Niehoff made the statement in his article that nobody can out-church the church. Mm -hmm. And what he meant by that was, yeah, you can get content from a variety of places, but he said the thing that the church offers that others don't is that human connection, you know, the, the entangling of life on life and, uh, and, and people being in proximity to each other in groups. And he said that's going to be one of our greatest strengths coming out of the pandemic is that we're going to rediscover that it's not necessarily about the didactic teaching that'll take place in our groups. It will be about, will we balance that, you know, the teaching that typically happens, you know, nine to noon on a Sunday morning with people's great need for fellowship and relationship and those type of things. He said, if churches will, will balance that, they're, they're going to win. They're going to do just fine coming out of the pandemic. Uh, and if we go back to what a lot of churches do, because I do a lot of traveling and training now on Sunday afternoons is kind of the, the sweet spot, it seems like, for a lot of churches. So I'll go in, I'll fly in, you know, and uh, be there Saturday night, and then I'll go to church on Sunday morning, but I won't tell anybody I'm coming. I'll just go pick a group. And, and I don't know about y'all, but what I typically see, I mean, I see teachers that are, that are prepared, they've studied, but the lessons are very one-dimensional, very uh, monologue-ish, and the people are not really engaged. And, uh, and it feels like in the groups that I've attended like that, that, that folks really are starving for participation and they're starving to be able to, you know, put their two cents in, tell their stories and ask questions. But they're just not really allowed. So man, I think uh, I think one of those things that we will see coming through the pandemic is groups that have made room for space for people uh, relationally is going to be uh, super strong. You mentioned the book earlier, the uh, the one on Arthur Flake and his formula. And, you know, number three or four on that list is provide the space. Right. And he meant physical space. But I think that these days, David, Providing for a relational space is going to be just about as important as physical space for people to meet. People need a physical or a, 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 you know, a space where they can develop relationships as well. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see that as one of those big trends coming out of uh, COVID. Yeah. yeah, that's good. I think that's a healthy, healthy trend. Uh, and I've Very been good. pleased. I think, I think more and more pastors are really talking about the need for developing uh, discipleship uh, as, as priority. Uh, over right. some of the other things that that tend to take us away. Well, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna take this dangerous step. I'm gonna put us back in gallery view and um, invite others to be a part of the conversation here. So, and I really mean that. I hope you will. So, if you've got if you want to push back, um, especially on Ken, not me so much. But if you got something you want to uh, to push back on Ken about uh, or me. Uh, please, uh, if you would jump in, or if you have a question, um, maybe you didn't get to submit one or maybe you did and we didn't address it or, or touch on it at all. 
Um, here's what I would ask. There's what, 15 of us on here, um, which is kind of a large Sunday school class. So uh, ask your questions, but if we can, we'll keep our comments and I'll do the same. We'll keep comments or, or uh, questions fairly brief so that as many people as want to can have something to say. And if we have a chance for a second go around, we'll do that too. So Ken, I'll just open it up and we'll see what we get. Absolutely, this is the fun part right here. So yes, we'll take questions, comments and snarky remarks. Yeah. You're likely to get some of those from this group. <laughs> I would expect nothing less from a group of Texans. Hey, Ken, uh, Lawrence Cole here. Good to see you again. Hi, Lawrence. <laughs> you too, sir. Um, uh, we're, we're struggling trying to develop some new metrics to measure the changes that we now see, especially in the terms of relationships. Uh, we're encouraging our classes to coming out of COVID to be more grassroots oriented in their relationships. Perfect. Uh, we find that there's a great need and desire for uh, good relationships. Not that there weren't any, but we want to foster more of that. Uh, what kind of metrics or dashboards have you seen used out there that uh, would help measure these kind of new changes? Great question. I've not seen any dashboards uh, with regard to that, uh, but here, here's a bit of good news, Lawrence. Uh, we're working on a book right now uh, called uh, Creating a New Scorecard for Groups. It comes out in June of 22, and it is all about measuring everything but attendance uh, to determine how effective groups are. And it's amazing that there are so many things to look at uh, to determine you know, group health. And the relationship side of things uh, is actually uh, one of uh, four giant um, how would I say it, uh, four expectations of groups, it's the third expectation out of the four, that we would build deep relationships. And so uh, I think, you know, when you look at that part of it, uh, you have to ask the question, you know, do our people have relational space in their lives or has the has the church accidentally over-programmed to where every time you know, we turn around, you know, we're supposed to be at church. And I think one of the new things going forward, Lawrence, is going to be this idea that, you know, we've got a culture out there that, that really needs the message that our churches have, always has. But uh, so much of our time and energy is spent at the church address. I think if we're going to go forward and make that difference and, and be much more relational and outward focused, uh, we're going to have to have margin in our calendars to do that. And we're gonna, people need permission to not be at church all the time. You know, I, I think it's just as spiritual a thing to go play around a golf with three guys from my neighborhood that I know are, you know, lost as balls in tall grass. And I'm going to go try to spend three or four hours with them to build a relationship so that I can ultimately, you know, share the gospel with these guys. So they'll trust me, you know, when they hear, you know, the words coming out of my mouth. So I think that's going to be part of it going forward. But as far as, you know, a dashboard, I guess you might say, I guess we're trying to create a dashboard, so to speak, with the, with the book, as we're thinking through, you know, what makes for healthy groups and, uh, Manuscript is due in about four weeks on July the 1st, so clock's ticking. It's almost almost done. Hey. Well, glad, glad to hear that y'all are struggling with that. We are too. Yeah. And uh, my only concern is it's due out in 22. I need it due out in June of 21. I understand. Well, uh, hey, Lawrence, if you can wait till June 24th, we're going to do another one of these, and the topic will be uh, changing the church scorecard for greater health. So uh, send me any inputs you've got, things that you've learned. And uh, let's, it'll be, and that one will be truly a, a round table. So it'll be more kind of whiteboard. Let's talk about these topics or whatever. Okay, look forward to that. Thank you. Yeah. And Lawrence, thanks for posting your, uh, the group of MAs, MEs that meet at Sam's Pizza in Cedar Hill. The pizza is pretty good, but the fellowship's even better. There you so go. if you're in the in the Metroplex, let's see, Tan, I think you go to the Fort Worth group every now and then. Uh, Davey, you pull together a group in, in Houston area. Bruce, if you're in East Texas, Bruce Welch is your guy. Um, and we've got some others as well. But yeah, speaking of relationships and community, uh, that's something you're going to be hearing more about uh, on a professional level from us as well, from our team. So get ready, you guys who are on the screen. Other thoughts, questions? Helping group leaders embrace healthy change. Cliff? Well, yeah, I was, I would, before he mentioned the book, I was just wondering, well, what else besides Carrie Newhouse Fifth Point, you know, has been addressed to those, that need? So do 
do you guys have any other resources that you're drawing on as you're writing this book that are good for creating relational space? Just that theme. Uh, just experience at this point, Cliff. I don't think that I I don't think that I have used many references yet to you know resources outside this document yet. Mm -hmm. But that's coming because once I, you know, once we get the document, uh, the manuscript finished, the, the writing finished, then we're going to go back and we will be inserting uh, some references to books. But as far as those go, uh, I can't tell you what they're going to be just yet. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure what in the business world would, would relate to that kind of relational space or I always, yeah. I always talk about social space. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the best way to create new social space is to create new groups. Yeah. Uh, but um, if, yeah. if you have any thoughts I will on say, that, that'd be I will say this about the relationship side of things. I, I think this goes back to one of the uh, uh, challenges that we've had in our Sunday schools uh, across the country. And, and you guys can give me thumbs up or down if, you, if this is you know, something that is an issue where you are. But uh, it feels like what's happened in Sunday school is that in some places we've uh, allowed groups to get, I'm going to say, fairly large. You know, they've moved out of that small range. And it's almost like, you know, there's a thought that bigger is better, you know, and uh, the guy or the person that's got the, you know, the biggest group wins kind of a thing. And, uh, and I'm, just, I'm just not a huge fan of that for making disciples. I think it's, they're fun to teach, right? Because you could be talking to 40, 50, 70, 80 people. I mean, that's, that's fun. And I can teach a group, but I can't disciple a group like that. Because my understanding of discipleship is that that takes, be, uh, takes place best in the context of a small group. You go, well, how small? Well, we surveyed when David Francis was our Sunday school director and Rick Howerton was our small group expert. They did a little debate about groups in Sunday school, and uh, they looked at other friends in ministry, and they said, what's the optimal size for a Bible study group? And here's what they decided. I mean, this was a group of experts, you know, probably 20, 25 folks that weighed in, and the number 12, plus or minus four, is what the groups came up with, both Sunday school leaders and small group leaders. So that means somewhere between eight and 16 people in a group. But 12 is kind of that optimal range, and you go, well, okay, Jesus had 12 disciples, right? And so that he might have been onto something, but he also had that little inner group of three. And, uh, and I think that groups, uh, I think groups that survived COVID pretty well were our smaller, our smaller groups, because many of those didn't quit meeting. They met in driveways, they met in backyards, they met in park pavilions, they met in restaurants, you know, they, where they could get a back room. And those, it was the big groups that struggled and that haven't met. Some of them haven't met for a year because they couldn't figure out six feet of social distancing and a place to go meet. So they said, eh. You know, we just we just won't meet and uh, maybe they tried online, maybe they didn't. And so I think part of the new paradigm going forward and one of the changes that we need to be ready to lead our people to do is to downsize so that we can do better discipleship. I think that uh, we need to recapture that. What do you think, Cliff? I think that would be a very unique message to send to Sunday schools. Time to downsize. <laughs> Time to downsize. Yep. There, there, there are ways to say it and ways to not say it. And I, can, yeah. I, I can tell you. I can For tell sure. you almost all the ways to not say it. I've got some. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. Tim Morrell, can I put you on the spot? So Tim's a pastor, one of our pastors, and has just uh, finished up his doctoral work related to discipleship and implementing a discipleship strategy. Anything on this idea of change and how you move a church uh, to a healthy view of groups? If if you don't have a ready answer, that's fine. I know I'm putting you on the spot, but I would be interested because you've just spent a lot of time. Are you frozen? I think we lost Tim. Thank you, frozen. Are you there? He fell asleep with his eyes open. No, he didn't fall asleep. <laughs> he heard me call his name and decided that. Uh, Tim, if you can hear us, be thinking. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, what else? What are you struggling with, or what do you what do you need uh, additional eyes and ears on today? I'm going to say too one more thing here about our groups. Um, again, this is going to be one of those opportunities coming out of COVID. I'm going to I'm going to make it a large assumption here that may not be true, uh, and if it's not, then you just don't listen to the Lifeway guy. But I have a feeling that in many of our groups. We do not have uh, we do not have a, uh, an apprentice teacher or teachers 
in those groups. And so we struggle to start those new ones. We struggle to send people into our preschool kid ministries, our student ministries out of our adult groups. Um, and so I think uh, apprenticing people is going to be another one of those wonderful opportunities uh, about discipleship and making some changes in our groups. Uh, I think those apprentices are really the, the number one sign that those groups are getting serious about you know, expanding the kingdom and doing other work outside of the group. And, uh, and I think that uh, an apprentice leader uh, in those groups could be a wonderful new thing for groups to have if we lead them that direction. And, and there's a big difference between the apprentice and the sub, right? The sub is just there when the teacher's sick. The apprentice has a regular cadence of teaching and they are being groomed uh, purposefully to start another group or to take over that group as that teacher steps down and you know retires out of teaching or takes a sabbatical or whatever. I think that's another great opportunity and another change that'd be very help, healthy uh, in our group's ministries is if every group, every adult group in particular, you know, had uh, had those apprentice leaders. And, and it would work absolutely you know, in the same way uh, with kid and student ministries too. They need apprentices in there as well. So are y'all seeing a lot of people step out of teaching roles right now or not? Tan says, no, that's great. That's good. We even started two new classes during the pandemic. That's awesome. Which is good. And yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. It's really interesting. People had predicted uh, earlier in the pandemic, I'm going to say mid-year last year, that we were going to face a disastrous the church, you know, that we're going to lose 30% of our people. You know, it's just going to be terrible. And uh, I'm very happy to share a bit of good news. Lifeway Research, Scott McConnell, our director there, uh, surveyed, it was over a thousand uh, churchgoers, and they released this finding about a month and a half ago. 91% of the churchgoers that are surveyed are planning on being back in church just the second that they feel safe. And so that's one of, that's nine out of 10 by my calculations. Right. And so that's not, you know, three out of 10 bailing and we don't know where they are. So the research is telling us, at least at this point, we'll see what the numbers actually are in fall and winter, but uh, the people out there look like they're ready to come back and they're ready to come back either at pre COVID or higher levels. And so that's, that's a great news story. I think for the church, it's not going to be as bad as we thought it was going to be and the doomsayers were predicting early on. Yeah, I think all you guys on the screen have some relationship to children's ministry as well. So, I'd, Jennifer, I would ask you that same question. What are you seeing as far as people coming back, especially with children's and preschool leadership? Is there a do you see a drop off? Are you hearing drop offs or uh, or not? Yes, I was actually surprised by your responses because in children's ministry we are seeing a drop off. Um, I, I would say even up to 50% in some cases. And so, and that, I don't think I've heard of any church saying that they have full capacity as far as children's ministry leaders. So we are seeing an impact there. And as you know, in preschool and children's ministry, you need more hands, and especially the younger the ages are, you need more help. And so that's kind of created a bit of a crisis for some of our ministries, not having the help that they need. So I, I regularly consult with ministers and that's their top question. How do I get more volunteers? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Tim, did you hear me call your name earlier? And then you, and then you went offline when I asked you a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I heard Tim around my computer. Went, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Nobody, said, nobody, so nobody I'll moved. start over. Yeah. So I know I'm putting you on the spot, but in any of your research and writing, is there anything that you would say needs to be said or spoken into this conversation about leading change toward the discipleship model rather than just simply um, educational model? Well, as far as leading change is concerned, um, you know, I read, of course, Cotter's um, material and um, Tom Rayner, you know, who we just like said baptized some of Tom, uh, John Cotter's uh, stuff. <laughs> Lots of people have baptized uh, Cotter. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, added a few things to it, but um, specifically what we did as far as change is concerned is we, we brought a bunch of people on board and, and like, I didn't come into it saying, Hey, I have some ideas. Here's what we're going to do. We said, look, I, we want to develop a, a discipleship strategy. And we've got, we got like 13 team, you know, on our team and we, and we work that out together. And so specifically in regards to, the discussion we're having here, the thing that we added, like we have our normal Sunday school, which is super, super important in Flatonia, Texas. Uh, 
that's not going anywhere. We love it. And, and it's still very important, but we added a small group discipleship element, um, which we call aim groups abide in me, uh, which is the three to five same gender, uh, groups right. where in the research that I did in order for people to, in my, in my opinion, on based on all that research in order for them to become, um, to really the discipleship process to really kick in, they have to become more and more vulnerable, right? And I think that's a that's a phrase that we're, as Ken talked, we're hard. It's hard to do that when you have twenty people in class. You just can't do it, you know. But you got three to five same gender, you know, folks you can meet. You can confess your sins. <laughs> you can pray uh, more specifically for each other. Ask your questions that you might not ask in a big group. So, so we did not. Um, change by taking anything away as far as Sunday school is concerned we just added that element to it yeah okay thanks right okay do you mind me asking a follow-up question on that how did you do that like how oh, you, you said you have Sunday school and then you had uh small groups that you added on in this uh, the aim groups that are three to five so how did you uh you know how did you process that well um it's at, I mean, Sunday school for us is still very traditional 930 Sunday morning, right? So what I'm talking about are groups that meet outside of that time. And, and, and as Ken said to, you know, maybe not physically at the church, some, some of them meet at the church, but, but many of them don't. And so um, the word that our group liked was organic uh, and yeah. they did not want to be over processed uh, and over programmed. So we started with the few leaders that we had willing to lead a group, uh, uh -huh. a lot of, whom were in our committee that, that started that uh -huh. and, or the team that started that. And um, they each picked three to five folks and, and met on a Tuesday night or a Thursday night or <laughs> some other time other than the traditional Sunday school. So it didn't take anything away from the Sunday school, not, not in our context. Yeah. You know, okay. So time. how will you then grow that from that point since that you started with your committee group of people? So are that you going to try to get them to reproduce that or are you just going to get the word out exactly. kind of word of mouth thing or exactly. And the hardest part is I'm sure these guys will say is it's getting the leaders, even if someone who's been in one of those groups for an entire year, mm -hmm. don't, they don't feel like they're able to lead yet. And it's like, come on, you can do it. You can do it. Uh, so trying to uh, develop the leaders from within that, because you need more leaders. I mean, it's, you know, and so you try to get the, the groups themselves to identify who who could be a leader the next year, the next semester, however often you do them. Gotcha. I just realized I hadn't removed the pins from me and Ken. Were we still big on y'all screen? Or do y'all have everybody? Okay, good. I just thought it was oh, gallery man. view the whole it was gallery view the whole time. Oh, okay, good. To me it was. Okay. Well, um, it, you know, related to leadership, if, even if you're not losing adult leaders, I think one of the changes that that may need to happen in some of our churches is that some of those key leaders that we've had, whether they're Sunday school teachers or in some other ministry area, if they've got a heart for discipleship, man, I think we need to grab them and put them in key positions of discipleship rather than letting them float along somewhere else. Uh, where they may feel needed and may feel uh, somewhat fulfilled. But if, if, if they have a heart for discipleship, um, this would be a, this is a good time to maybe re-engage people in different kinds of ministries um, and, and discover some folks who uh, maybe needed to be making disciples a, a long time ago, just didn't have the tools or the opportunity. Um, well, um, our time is about gone. What else do you guys have that you'd like to throw out? David, I'm going to send you uh, a copy, a digital copy of a book called Together, The Power of Groups, if I haven't already. Do you know if okay. I did? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. So send it. Yeah. So I'm going to send it because it's got some of our latest research on uh, why people attend groups, get involved in groups, uh, why they step away from groups and those kind of things. And and one of the things that we discovered through that uh, little research project was that uh, very few people ever leave a, leave a group because of the teacher and the content. They leave majorly because of a life change 
job changes or something they can't attend anymore. Uh, it's it's almost nothing uh, that we have to do with, you know, that's the number one reason, right? The, the life change. And so I say all that to say that uh, if if people don't leave a group because of the quality of the that leader or the content of the material, um, you know, as, as we wrote that book, Scott McConnell asked the question in the book, maybe he said, you know, have we have we not pressed people into a, a leadership role because we were looking for, you know, some some really spectacular teachers when really somebody that's got a, a shepherd's heart uh, that maybe not be, you know, that, you know, hey, I'm going to teach 30 people kind of a person, but they would be glad to shepherd, you know, a half a dozen people to a dozen folks. He said, maybe our churches are really full of more leaders than we really realize. And I think that's true because back when I was, you know, doing full-time ministry on staff there in Texas, I was always on the hunt. I was always looking for the, you know, the, the up and coming Billy Graham kind of a person. And I think I missed putting some really good people in leadership roles over groups that had that shepherd's heart. And if I had my ministry to do over again, that's one of those things I'd go back and change. And I would put more shepherds in charge of groups, not teachers in charge of groups. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And I think we've, over the years, we've created this image of what a Sunday school teacher looks like. And if we truly want to shift the conversation to teach well, but do it with discipleship in mind. Yes. And you yeah. begin to, to cast that vision. I think you're going to have some people who say, well, I'm up for that. I didn't want to do the old stuff, but I'm up for that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think, I think this is a, one of those times when that can happen. All right. Um, anything else? Good, good thoughts and good exchanges. I don't want to cut anybody off, but at the same time, I don't want to drag on so long that you drop off and then it's just me and Ken here talking to each other. <laughs> uh, All right. Well, Ken and I did put together a resource list and it includes some books and it includes his uh, blog link and a couple of other things. And so I'll send that to all of you guys uh, and gals once we're done here. Um, and then also just I mentioned earlier, the uh, the next round thing. Like, let me share my screen here for just a second. Um, if I can get to the right place. I think we're there. Um, so uh, txb.org slash roundtables is where we two things where we post our upcoming Discipleship Roundtables, and you see today's is here, uh, the one in June that I mentioned earlier, uh, Changing the Church Scorecard for Greater Health. Uh, comes up uh, June 24th, so register for that. And then we also always post these things, so uh, there may be one that you want to go back and grab. Uh, Corey Liebram and Jennifer Howington did one not long ago, but just in April, about summer planning for youth and childhood ministries, which was, there were some really good ideas that came out in both of those, by the way. So you might steer your youth and childhood folks to that. Uh, and you see some of the others, <clears throat> but there'll be more coming up as well. So uh, bookmark that if you would. Then I've got Ken's, <clears throat> excuse me, Ken's blog here as well. Kenbrady.com. And um, he's got some great, free training things there as well as some other recommendations for books and his blog that's excellent so check that it'll out change, it'll change your life you it lose will 10, you'll, you'll lose 10 pounds if you start reading the blog so i strongly encourage you to sign up change your life and, and i plagiarize <laughs> i plagiarize the heck out of your stuff all the time <laughs> very good i'll send you a check or send you a bill okay we would expect no less man thank you very much exactly exactly yeah, that's good uh and then we also have a Texas Baptist Discipleship Leaders. I think most of you guys are a part of this group, but if you're not, um, and it gets lively every now and then, it's not one of those groups that you're continually getting uh, getting pounded from or getting updates. But uh, when, if you have a question about discipleship, this is a good place to share that question. And usually there are three or four uh, good answers as well that come along. So if, you, if you're on Facebook, look for Texas Baptist Discipleship Leaders. Uh, let me stop sharing. And uh, what else, Ken? Anything I, else you'd like to share I, with? I, ju I just sent you the uh, together the power of groups book for everybody. If you want to email that out to the okay. group, it's got our latest research on why people attend groups and stop attending groups, uh, and it's it's got some some great uh, insights in there. It's not very long; it's about fifty pages. Uh, it's kind of like one of those you know, David Francis uh, annual Sunday school booklets, those kind of things. So it's a pretty quick read, but it's got, some, I think, some great information. And so that's yours to you know, feel free to share that with anybody you like. And then y'all yep. can reshare that, too. OK, great. Thank you. Appreciate that, Ken. 
Thanks hey, for David, is yes. it out of bounds here for you to say something about the discipleship retreat? It November is not out of bounds. Please retreat? say something. No, I, you can say something. No, Wait. you say something. Uh, <laughs> you're our we president. Have our, Texas Baptist Discipleship Leaders Retreat. The name has changed. It actually changed last year, but we didn't meet because of COVID. But uh, it's in New Braunfels at T-Bar M, uh, November 3rd through 5th. Correct me if that's, we, we pushed Fourth, it. and 6th, I think, but it's that week. Yeah. yeah, Wednesday through Friday. Wednesday through, through Friday. So we changed it from April to November this year, and we'd, uh, we'd love to see you there. It's a, it's a great time of connecting and we have Mike Bonham of Second Chair Leadership uh, be speaking this year. Yeah. In fact, one of the books on the uh, on the resource list that we'll send you is Mike Bonham's one of the one of the uh, authors of that. And I'm just looking for it. It's uh, Leading Congregational Change, a Practical Guide for, Trans for the Transformational Journey. And they borrow heavily from Cotter and from Heifetz, Adaptive Leadership, and also from uh, Kuzis and Posner, uh, Leadership Challenge. So, that, yeah, there you go. Thank you, Ken. Yeah. There it yep. is. It's a good one. It is. And in fact, if you register uh, early for the retreat, you'll get one of uh, Mike Bonham's books when you get there. So uh, I think that is a limited number of books. So spread the word, but register yourself first. Yeah. Um, Texas so Baptist, can... go to the website. Yeah. And register. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So, all right. Well, thank you guys. Oh, one more thing. Sorry. Put Write this down. You all have a pencil in front of you pen, write this down, type it out. Saturday, October 16th from 9 to 11. Um, our discipleship staff is going to do online training for your Sunday school leaders and group leaders. And here's the thing with, I mean, all of you guys, most of you guys said you're not really losing that many leaders, but I'm betting you're looking for new ones all the time. And so this will really be gear, geared to, um, it won't just be for new leaders, but that's going to be kind of our focus is back to the basics because all of us have, you know, there's been a little bit of a uh, hiatus uh, for some. And so we want to jump back in and offer that to anybody who, who wants to, uh, to be a part of it. It'll be free on that Saturday morning. You'll get some more information about it, but just know that um, October 16th, there'll be some training for you. And if you know some, especially smaller churches, a lot of times don't have the resources for any training. And this is, this is too easy. Um, so share the word with other churches, if you would, and, uh, Ken, if you want to share the word with other, uh, other states, that's fine too. Uh, yeah, be happy to do that. That's great. Uh, so it'll just be basic training. Jennifer will lead, um, children's preschool, uh, Corey Liebram, our youth and family ministry specialist will lead uh, sessions for youth. I'll, I may even bring Phil Miller in still trying to work up the courage to ask Phil. Uh, to be a part of that. Uh, yeah. And so anyway, mark that. Larry Floyd, what do you have for us, brother, in El Paso? That's what I was going to say. Your timing is central time, right? Our timing is central time. That's right. Okay. Just want to make sure. I figured that'd be eight to 10 for us in yeah. the morning. You okay. can do that. I know that's earlier than you normally get up. Yeah. Dude, have you been to El Paso? It's everything's manana. <laughs> I've been to El Paso. <laughs> I'd like to be invited back. Anytime, brother, anytime. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks all of you for being with us. Um, I'll hang around for a few minutes if anybody just wants to chat and you got time to waste. I mean, time to burn this afternoon. Um, but it's been good to see all of you and I appreciate your friendship and your input. Uh, Ken, thank you again. Sorry, I didn't mean to. To, to leave without saying thank you again to you, Ken, uh, a good friend. Ken will be at our retreat, by the way. And um, so I think he's going to load his sleigh and uh, it's November. So almost Christmas and come down and, and join us. Uh, we'll look forward to that. Sleigh and golf clubs. And golf clubs. That's right. Yep. If it's not, well, it won't be snowing here in November. So it'll be warm. All right. Good <laughs> to see you guys. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Nice. Nice. See you later.